Jack the Ripper, the mysterious serial killer whose identity has long remained a mystery. DNA from a shawl recovered at the scene of one of his crimes has incredibly found a 100% match. The Jack the Ripper case is officially closed. That's not clickbait, it's a scientific fact. After 137 years, DNA evidence has confirmed his identity. We are going to reveal the name, the science, and the story. But what nobody tells you is how this man, a known and violent individual, was allowed to roam free and how the police knew about him. The evidence points to one person, and it's not who you think. This changes the entire legend. The 137-year-old clue. The story of the final reveal begins with a shawl said to have been found at the scene of the fourth slaying, Catherine Eddowes. For decades, this artifact was passed down, dismissed by many as a fake. You see, it was just one of many so-called Ripper items floating around. But in 2007, an author and amateur sleuth named Russell Edwards bought it at an auction. He was convinced it was real and he was willing to bet his reputation on one final desperate attempt to solve the case using technology the Victorian police could only dream of. Edwards tracked down Dr. Jerry Luhalenin, a world-renowned expert in genetic analysis from old, degraded samples. This wasn't like a fresh TV crime show. This was a piece of silk that was over 120 years old, contaminated by countless hands, by time, and by the elements. Getting anything from it would be a miracle. Dr. Lohalainen got to work. He and his team focused on the stains. Using advanced techniques, they carefully extracted the genetic material that was left. They were looking for something called mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA. Here's what you need to know about mtDNA. Unlike regular DNA, which is a mix from both parents, you only get mtDNA from your mother. And she gets it from her mother and so on, passed down in an unbroken female line for thousands of years. It's tough, it lasts a long time, and it's the perfect genetic time traveler. The first test was to see if the shawl was even real. The team found a living descendant of Catherine Eddowes' sister. They took a sample and compared it to the DNA from the blood stains on the shawl. It was a perfect match. The shawl was real. It had been at the scene, soaked in the victim's blood. But then they found something else. Mixed in with the victim's DNA were other trace samples, including semen. This was it. This was the perpetrator's genetic signature. The team found a living female line descendant of a suspect sister and tested her. Again, it was a match. After 137 years, the science pointed to one man. And it's not who you think. It wasn't a prince. It wasn't a doctor. It wasn't a famous artist. His name was Aaron Kosminski. The name might not ring a bell, but to the police in 1888, it was at the top of their list. This wasn't a new suspect. This was the man they always thought it was. Aaron Kosminski was a Polish immigrant who had fled to London. He worked as a hairdresser in Whitechapel, the very heart of the terror. He was known to be mentally unwell, a man plagued by dark visions and violent rages. What many overlooked is that the top cops of the day practically shouted his name. Chief Constable Melville McNaughton wrote a famous memo in 1894 that named Kosminski as a primary suspect. He described him as a man who had a strong homicidal tendency but the most chilling evidence comes from Chief Inspector Donald Swanson. Swanson was the man who oversaw the entire investigation. He was there on the ground every single day. Years later, he got a copy of his boss's memoirs. In the margin of the book, right next to the section about the Ripper, Swanson scribbled a note. He wrote that the perpetrator was Kosminski, the man who was sent to an asylum and perished there. This is a bombshell. The officer in charge of the case knew his name. Kosminski lived right in the middle of the slaying locations. He was known to be violent. And then in 1891, his family finally had him committed to an asylum where he stayed for the rest of his life. And when did the Jack the Ripper slaying stop? Right when Kosminski was taken off the streets. The DNA, the timeline, and the police testimony all point to one man. Kosminski was the man. But why was he never stopped? To understand, we have to go back to the nightmare he created. Whitechapel's Nightmare To understand the monster, you have to understand the world that made him. The London of 1888 was not the charming city of top hats and carriages you see in movies. To put it mildly, it was a tale of two cities. While the rich lived in grand houses in the West, the East End, especially Whitechapel, was a living nightmare. It was one of the most crowded, diseased, and desperate places on Earth. 
Over 900,000 people were crammed into a few square miles, a tangled mess of narrow unlit streets, dark alleys, and hidden courtyards. The air itself was toxic. Thick yellow fog, a mix of river mist and black coal smoke from thousands of chimneys, choked the city. This pea super fog was so dense, you sometimes couldn't see your own hand in front of your face. It was the perfect cover for a predator. There was no safety net. Poverty was a death sentence. The heart of this world was the lodging house. These were filthy, horrible places where you could rent a bed or even just a spot on the floor for a few pennies a night. For the women who became the Ripper's victims, life was a constant daily struggle to find those few pennies. They would do anything for the price of a bed just to avoid sleeping in a dark alley. This is what made them so vulnerable. They were not ladies of the night in the way movies show. They were middle-aged, poor, and desperate women trying to survive one more day. They had to walk the streets late at night, in the fog and the dark, looking for any way to earn the DOS money for their bed. What many overlooked is that this environment didn't just hide the monster, it helped him. The police were overwhelmed. They had no radios, no forensic science. Their main tool was a whistle and a wooden stick. In the maze of Whitechapel, a man could commit a terrible act and vanish into the fog and the crowds in less than a minute. The predator didn't need to be a genius, he just needed to be local. He needed to know the alleys, the shadows, and the escape routes, and he needed to know who to pick. The women so desperate they would trust a stranger for a moment, and so poor that no one would notice they were gone until it was too late. The streets were a trap. Now meet the women who walked right into it. A pattern of brutality. The name Jack the Ripper is famous, but the names of the women he targeted are often forgotten. They are known as the Canonical Five, the five victims that almost all experts agree were the work of one man. Their stories show a terrifying pattern. It all began on August 31st, 1888. Mary Ann Nichols, a 43-year-old woman, was found in a dark gateway called Buck's Row. She had been seen just minutes earlier trying to get money for her lodging. Her throat was cut so deeply it was almost severed. The act was fast, brutal, and silent. The city was shocked, but this was just the beginning. Only eight days later, on September 8th, it happened again. The body of Annie Chapman, 47, was discovered in the backyard of a house on Hanbury Street. This time, the horror was far worse. The perpetrator had not just ended her life, he had mutilated her body with a terrifying, calculated precision. He had taken items. The newspapers went insane. Suddenly, this wasn't just a street crime. The idea of a mad doctor or a crazed surgeon was born. Then came the double event. On September 30th, the predator went on a rampage. In the early morning hours, the body of Elizabeth Stride, 44, was found in Dutfield's yard. Her throat was cut, but her body was not mutilated. The man who found her had just entered the yard, and it's believed he interrupted the perpetrator who fled into the night. But he wasn't finished. The thing is, getting interrupted only made him angrier. Less than one hour later and only a mile away, a policeman walking his beat in Mitre Square found the body of Catherine Eddowes, 46. This scene was one of pure butchery. He had done to her what he was stopped from doing to Elizabeth Stride and more. It was a defiant, terrifying act. And it was at this scene that the stained shawl was found, the very piece of fabric that would one day hold his DNA. The city was in a full-blown panic, but the worst was yet to come. On November 9th, the predator changed his pattern. Mary Jane Kelly was different. She was much younger, only 25, and she had her own small room, a tiny, miserable space on Miller's Court. This time, the perpetrator wasn't in a dark alley. He was indoors. He had privacy. He had time. What police found in that room the next morning was so horrific it can't be described. Seasoned officers, men who had seen everything, were physically ill. He had spent hours in that room. It was the horrifying climax of his rage. And then, silence. The slaying stopped. The attacks were brutal, public, and terrifying. So where were the police? Letters from hell. With the city screaming for answers, the London police force launched one of the biggest manhunts in history. They flooded Whitechapel with officers. They interviewed thousands of people. They followed every lead. So why did they fail? You see, they weren't just fighting a man, they were fighting the time they lived in. First, there was no such thing as forensic science. The concept of a crime scene was brand new. When a victim was found, crowds would rush in, reporters would trample over evidence, and the scene would be contaminated in minutes. 
Police had no fingerprinting, they had no blood typing. All they had were witness reports, and in the dark, foggy streets, those reports were a mess. Some said he looked shabby, others said he looked respectable. It was useless. What's truly wild is that they did find clues, but didn't know what to do with them. Near the scene of Catherine Eddowes, they found a piece of her bloody apron. On the wall above it, someone had written in chalk, the Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Was it a clue from the perpetrator? We'll never know. The police commissioner, Sir Charles Warren, worried it would start anti-Semitic riots, so he ordered it erased immediately. They washed away one of the only pieces of evidence they ever found. Then came the letters. The predator became a celebrity when the Dear Boss letter arrived at a news agency. Signed with the chilling name Jack the Ripper, it taunted the police and promised more to come. This letter was a sensation. It was printed in every paper. The problem? Almost everyone now agrees it was a fake, probably written by a journalist to sell more papers. But it worked. It created a media circus and sent the police on a wild goose chase following thousands of copycat letters. While the public was obsessed with fake letters and wild theories about doctors and royals, the police were quietly building their own list of serious suspects. They had a few. There was Montague Druitt, a barrister who took his own life right after the final slaying. There was George Chapman, a man who poisoned three of his wives. And then there was Aaron Kosminski. He was their best suspect. The police on the beat knew him. They knew he lived in the epicenter of the crimes. They knew he was mentally unstable and had a deep hatred of women. He was watched, but they never got the final piece of evidence to arrest him. Back then, you couldn't arrest someone just for being a strong suspect. And so he walked free until his own family had him put away for good and the nightmare finally stopped. The police had his name. He was on their list. So why is this new DNA evidence so controversial? So that's it, right? Case closed. The DNA from the shawl points to Aaron Kosminski, the police's number one suspect, whose institutionalization matches the exact end of the slayings. It's a perfect fit. Well, not so fast. This is where the story gets complicated and where you have to decide for yourself. Many people, especially those who love the Ripper mystery, are not convinced. The moment the DNA findings were published in 2019, critics came out swinging. Their biggest argument, contamination. The shawl is over 137 years old. It's been handled by police, by collectors, and by Russell Edwards' own team. How do we know the DNA isn't just from one of them or from the air? To put it mildly, that's a huge problem. The DNA evidence is compelling, but is it the final word? Or is the real Ripper still laughing at us from the shadows? Let us know what you think. Like and subscribe for more.